Isaiah 61, verse 1, the mighty spirit of the Lord Yahweh is wrapped around me because Yahweh has anointed me as a messenger to preach good news to the poor. I want you to listen to this. He sent me to heal the wounds of the brokenhearted, to tell prisoners, be free from your darkness. How about that? Now I'm sent to announce a new season of Yahweh's grace and a time of God's recompense on his enemies to comfort all who are in sorrow, to strengthen those crushed by despair who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful bouquet in the place of ashes. I love that. The oil of bliss instead of tears and the mantle of joyous praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. Because of this, they will be known as mighty oaks of righteousness. <laughs> Planted by Yahweh as a living display of his glory. They will restore ruins from long ago and rebuild what was long devastated. They will renew ruined cities and desolations of past generations. Foreigners will be appointed to shepherd your many flocks. Strangers will cultivate your fields and tend your vines. Return back up to verse one again. The mighty spirit of the Lord Yahweh is wrapped around me because he's anointed me to preach the message of good news to the poor. Now the word poor there is not a great translation. It should have been to the depressed or lowly. It has nothing to do with economics. It works for economics, but this is not about economics. This is about people who need good news who are living in a state of being depressed or lowly and the very next thing he says is, he sent me to heal the wounds of the brokenhearted. Now we go through beauty for ashes, strength for fear, gladness for mourning, uh, garment of praise for spirit of heaviness. All of that's important. It's big. I could go through all of those words. I've done that before. I'm not going to tonight. But I want you to skip down just a little ways. And you'll find here in, in the B clause of verse 3, because of this, they will be known. Can y'all get to that? I don't know. You, you even had it on the screen. A little bit more, one more down. Now go back one. Yeah, let's do that one first. To console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Then watch this shift here in the B clause. That they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Take that off the screen, that new King James stuff. Terrible, that's terrible. I got a book in my office for anybody who still wants to fight to use the King James Bible. It's called Living and Dying by the King James Bible. It will set you free from all the nonsense. To even tell you about King James's three homosexual boyfriends he had. That we have the letters that he wrote to his homeless. So anybody who writes me an email about using the Mirror Study Bible, your King James Bible was... <laughs> yeah. So the brokenhearted become the oaks of righteousness, the planting of Yahweh. The oaks of righteousness are those who were in another season were brokenhearted. In another season, they were lowly and depressed. In another season, they were dealing with mourning. In another season, they were operating under heaviness. And a supernatural exchange takes place by the way, by way of what Yeshua carries. And by way of what Yeshua carries, people who were previously identified one way are now supernaturally re-identified as oaks of righteousness, the planning of the Lord. And whenever, and whenever we get into uh, desolate cities being repaired and cities being renewed and things that have been left in ruin begin to be restored, it's happening by way of a people who had happen in their interior world first what they're called to make happen in cities. So your interior garden, no longer being a desert, is phase one of city reclamation. Of reforming entire cultures, the first fruit of cultural reformation is internal reform. And people who said, I was depressed a minute ago, are saying, now I have the oil of gladness. People who were lowly a minute ago said, I have heard a message of good news that has break, broken me out of a state of depression and lowliness. 
And my favorite one is people who in another season would have identified themselves as brokenhearted have now so been put back together by the anointing of Yeshua that they are now identified as oaks of righteousness. Brokenheartedness is inevitably going to produce inconsistency. Why? Because you cannot engage with this without your heart. That most churches you go to in America, you'll not even need your heart to participate to be a part. But when you get in these waters and this kind of flow, it necessitates that you're able to connect beyond your intellect and really in the deepest seat of who you are. And when the Bible talks about heart, it's not talking about this. Okay. When the Bible talks about heart, it's talking about the sentient seed of your desires, the core of what constitutes your identity. It's the word in the Hebrew is bowels. It's not heart. It's your deepest insides. We could say it's your guts. And when you've been broken in the deepest place and part of who you are, King Yeshua does not come just to forgive you of your sins and teach you to cope with brokenness. He comes to put you back together and this is his initial self-declaration of who he is in Luke 4. The very first thing we hear him say, he unrolls the scroll and says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to set the captives at liberty, to mend the brokenhearted, to preach recovery of sight to the blind, to preach the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolls up the scroll and says, and this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. That was about me. And they get furious. They get furious because of his self-declaration that Isaiah was talking about him. How arrogant do you have to be? But they also get offended because he leaves out their favorite part of the dialogue. Right after it says the, the year of the favor of the Lord, it talks about the day of the vengeance of our God. And he purposefully leaves that part out. So in Isaiah 61, it goes like this. This is interesting. In Isaiah 61, it goes like this. <laughs> I am sent to announce a new season of Yahweh's grace and a time of God's recompense on all his enemies. He leaves that part out. And they are offended because he left out the part of the prophecy they wanted the most. Wow. Revenge on their enemies. And he said, that is not how we're going to restore cities. You're going to become an oak of righteousness, not by way of sitting back and laughing as your enemies get what they deserve. You're going to become an oak of righteousness when you learn how to forgive. Because you don't get to a whole heart by watching them get what they deserve. You get to a whole heart by releasing them and saying concerning your enemies, I trust that Yahweh is going to give mercy to them the way he gave mercy to me. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And we've had a little bit of this thing in us where we want God to do justice independent from love. And those two things are indivisible in the Hebrew. All right, so let's take a big leap. Now go to Romans 8. Woo, man, I feel this tonight. Romans 8. Hallelujah. And let me read my writing for today. We will be releasing a lot of these little paragraph or twos real quickly on the new website that they're getting up and going. I sent them. I don't know how many of them the other day, but I just have hundreds of these in my phone from over the years, and we're going we're gonna to put them out. I'm even going to audio record some of them so we can just send them out to you during the day. Are you ready? The key to everything from environmental reforms to seeing the end of the tragedy of war is not a people who understand the doctrine of adoption and believe in their theoretical sonship, but rather the key is a people who are so convinced that they are beloved, and as a result, they enter into a measure of union that manifests something far more significant than a doctrine of sonship, but actually releases the inheritance of likeness. I'm gonna read that whole thing again, you ready? 
The key to everything from environmental reforms to seeing the end of the tragedy of war is not a people who simply understand the doctrine of adoption and believe in their theoretical sonship, but rather the key is a people who are so convinced that they are beloved, and as a result, those people enter into a measure of union that manifests something far more significant than a doctrine of sonship, but actually releases the inheritance of likeness. Let me just clarify that because that's clear as mud, I'm sure. Let let me clarify that. This is really important. Um, Almost everybody knows right here they're a child. And almost everybody in here would know right here you're a son. But nothing has been changed by having a doctrinal concept of adoption and or sonship. I'm not inventing the doctrine of sonship. I'm not inventing the doctrine of adoption. We were predestined for adoption according to Ephesians 1. The spirit according to Romans 8 cries out to Abba, you are our father. We're convinced of God's fatherhood by way of the movement activity of the Holy Spirit. You following what I'm saying? All right, so knowing these things doctrinally or even having a theoretical understanding of said concepts is not what brings about the transformation. What brings about the transformation is when the son so knows that he's a son that he moves into the measure of union that actually manifests image bearing. And everybody right now to some degree bears the image because that's the Genesis mandate that you and I are created in the image and likeness of God. But nothing moves because we know in our mind we're sons. Things move when we begin to actualize an image. It's not enough to know you're a son. You need to let knowing you're a son move you into a measure of union that actually transforms the image that you demonstrate to the culture. We don't need people who know what Jesus taught and know what Jesus believed, but don't share Jesus's fellowship with his father. It's the fellowship that bursts the image bearing, or we say it like this, beholding is the means of becoming, right? right? And when we begin to see and understand and discern that, all of a sudden we begin to shift out of, let's write books and teach everybody they're sons of God. I, I don't think it's done anything. Even the doctrine of theosis is not something that's new to the Orthodox Church. It's definitely not something that's new to the church in the East. But it's not knowing about the doctrine of theosis that changes things. It's becoming theotic. It's divinization being actualized in an individual who is so pressed into union that by way of that union, they've been given the inheritance of carrying his image into the culture. So here's what I would say to you. Knowing you're a son positionally and not knowing how he feels about you in that position can actually keep you from the measure of union that'll transform your identity. David could defeat Goliath with faith in his experience and skill, but to take the throne, David would have to have faith in his identity. Come on, this is what I've been thinking on today. So there's a measure of breakthrough and success we may be able to have based on our ability to have faith in what God has anointed or called or gifted or talented us to do, given us the talent to do. But in order to really begin to rule and reign, we'll have to have an overhaul of our image and a faith in an understanding of what Yeshua did through his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and enthronement to not just give you gifts, but to give you his nature. So Peter said, we are partakers of the divine nature. And so one of the shifts in consciousness that I feel happening on the inside of me is a movement toward, yes, of course, we're sons of God. And no, we so know how the father feels about us that we have said yes to a higher degree of engagement. And out of way of a higher degree of engagement, we're moving from self-discipline to intentional engagement. We are engaging with him face to face. We sang tonight. This is important. We sang tonight. Um, I wrote some things. These songs you picked, guys picked tonight were amazing. 
um, I'm waking up to heaven. <laughs> I'm waking up to heaven. I first heard that. I said, what does that even mean? I'm waking up to heaven. See, Matthew called it the kingdom of heaven. Mark and Luke called it the kingdom of God. John called it life. John called it Zoe. John doesn't even talk about the kingdom of God. John talks about life and life more abundantly. I think that's why the glory hid in here yesterday at 1010. John 1010. The thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. This is a witness of a lifestyle coming into the earth. I'm waking up, remember our carpet? To heaven. And I'm not a Platonist. Okay, so I don't have a platonic philosophy that puts heaven way off at a far flung distance and one day heaven will come from a way off, far off distance to here. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Magic man. <laughs> the kingdom of heaven is, is at hand. And then he said the kingdom of heaven is within. Let me take you a little further. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now let me take you a little further. The kingdom of heaven is within. Ooh. What is at hand is also within. And for some, it may only be at hand. For others, it may be within. For us, not only has it not been within, it hasn't even been at hand. It's been way off there somewhere and we're praying it returns. Or we're praying we get snatched out of here and go to it, which is even worse. Okay? So the shift in consciousness that you and I are learning to make by the grace we're inheriting inside of the revelation of beloved identity is that we can begin to now engage with what religion told us we could experience in another season called death. And if you have to die to get to the good stuff, it's not Jesus that saved you, it's death that did. No, no, when never ever when the Bible is talking about glory, is it talking about a place you go to after you die? Never. When we start saying things like they died and went to glory, that is absolutely an insult to the biblical concept of what the glory is. Nobody has ever gone to glory. Glory is something that's been designed for you and I now. Glorification, doxadzo is the Greek word, is an illuminative state that you and I were designed to live in now. John 17 that he shares with us the very glory that the Father had given to him. We get the very glory that the Father had given to him. All right? So we're going to look at this through Romans 8. Let me finish my little reading thing here real quick, all right? Um, actually, we actually move into the release of an inheritance of likeness, not just conceptually believing we are sons, but actually looking like our eldest brother, Yeshua, who is the exact image of the Father. From here, the groaning creation awakens to her glorious intention. You and I becoming a glorious is about so much more than great church services with altars filled with people who, who want to go to heaven when they die. No, no, no. We have had it all wrong. We are not escaping to glory. We are being invited to become glorious here and now. We are not escaping to glory. We are being invited to become glorious here and now. And you and I finally and fully entering into a glorious state as sons and daughters will indeed set creation free. But let me say this, not set the creation free because you know in your mind the Bible says you're a son. Set creation free because you start to think like the sun, act like the sun, talk like the sun, walk like the sun, and yes, look like the sun. Then creation goes, wait a minute. That I recognize. That's not a Baptist or a charismatic or a Pentecostal. That's an image bearer. And that's a game changer. And all of a sudden the trees say, what would you like for us to bring to you? Because you look like the one who made us. We don't just recognize you. We recognize the line from which you came from. 
Yeshua walks up and finds a fig tree that doesn't have fruit on it and rebukes it. The problem is the Bible says it wasn't the season for the tree to have figs. You get what I'm saying? It's not, it, he walks up to a fig tree and he curses the fig tree for not having figs. And the Bible says it wasn't supposed to have figs because it wasn't the season for the fig tree to have figs. Bill Johnson quoted, quoted the service. I had to quote him one time every service. It's like using the Bible. This is what he said. He said, he rebuked the fig tree for not having supernatural fruit. That's okay. That's not, that's not where I go with that. What I go to is I think he rebukes the fig tree for being subject to seasons while it's in that measure of presence. Yes. Yes. That's the first time I ever had one better than Bill Johnson. Thank y'all. I'm going to take myself to the Waffle House after this. I ain't lying. Scattered, covered, smothered, chunked. What you talking about? So, so get this. This is important. This is important. Jesus walks up to the fig tree and said, you should have started doing stuff because I was here. You should not have had figs on you because it's the right time. You don't get to be subject to what you feel like the time is once you get in this measure of presence. Once you get in this measure of presence, stuff starts sprouting and blooming and growing and fruit starts hanging off of you. And it's not because it's your season and everything in the circumstantial world is starting to work out. It's because King Jesus got so close to you that you had no choice but to begin to bloom. And I feel that happening. Some people's whole life is on hold until we, we, Trump gets elected again. Like we're all paralyzed and he's going to get elected again. Of course, the guy he's running against almost dead. I, I think I could win. Write me in. Let's see how that works. No, no, here's the, here's the whole concept. Here's the whole idea. Everybody wants everything to be aligned seasonally. I want Jesus to be here because if Jesus is being here, the, se is here, the season thing is over. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in that law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of living water that brings forth fruit, not in its season, brings forth fruit in every season. Its leaf will not wither, and whatsoever that man does will prosper. You're moving into a measure of presence, listen, that promises you a never withering leaf. If you go through another winter, it's your fault. Because the perpetual spring is the inheritance of the person living face to face with Jesus. And you know what happens? You become an oak of righteousness. Instead of being moved by storms, your roots go so deep that when the wind blows, it just becomes permission for you to get even stronger than you were before the wind started to blow. Hello, you feel this beginning to happen? And what I'm, what's beginning to happen is there's a group of people who are getting rooted and there's a group of people not being rooted. And the difference is some have opened their hearts and some have not let Yeshua dig through the rocks and give them the key. This is so big. I, I left here. When Jordan shared that Wednesday morning, I walked out of here and said, that's the most profound thing I've heard since I've been here, including stuff I've said. That was it. Why? Because the father in goodness wasn't keeping you from being connected. He was waiting for you to be ready for him to take you by the hand. See, he would have taken that walk whenever you were willing to take the walk, but he knows when you're willing to take the walk and he's literally looking for people that'll let him take you by the hand. He'll dig through the rocks. He'll dig through the dirt. You don't have to know where it is. He knows where it is. You don't have to have the key. He has the key. You don't have to put the key in the lock and unlock it. He does it and you don't have to figure out how to get your heart back in your chest. He'll do all of it if you and I will be willing to take the walk. All right. All right. Did I finish reading that thing? No. <laughs> You and I are becoming glorious is about so much more than great church services with altars filled with people who want to go to heaven when they die. No, no, no. We have had it all wrong. We are not escaping to glory. We are being invited to become glorious here and now. And you and I finally and fully entering into a glorious status as sons and daughters will indeed set creation free. Listen to this. And from that sacred and thus far anyway elusive state that I'm terming likeness or indeed oneness, everything, and yes, I mean everything is changing. Re listen to what Jordan said. From that point forward, 
everything changed. And I, I'm a witness yes. to what happened in him from that point forward. Yes. Not, not in an altar, not during a special part of the service, not like literally in the sound booth. And a vision happens, and the Lord gives him breakthrough. Listen to this. By way of supernatural encounter, not way of circumstances being rearranged. Many think the joy is a witness of the circumstances changing, and it's not. A joy is a witness that you have had a measure of encounter with the love of God that has birthed in you assurance that all of this is being worked by God for my good. This is big. So let's look at let's look at the Romans 8 part of this. And we're going to take another little trip over to Psalm 8 if we have time. Let's look at uh let's look at Romans 8 first and I'm I'm going to skip a little bit of the first part of this. I'll come back later on and uh and 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 pull some things from the first section of Romans 8. The first thing that I would say to you regarding Romans 8 is the genius of the way that Dr. Simmons translates Romans 8. And the error in which the Bible that most of us grew up with translated Romans 8, we grew up with something like this. There's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Walk not after the flesh but after the spirit is not in any of the most reliable original manuscripts. It was the addition of the authors that King James sent to translate the Bible that wanted to make sure they kept a legalistic orientation to what was being translated and and literally did not allow them to put in the Bible the story of the woman taken in adultery. Because that looks like people got grace and got to get off scot-free. And then did not want to put, there's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. He wanted to make sure he added something there who walked not after the flesh, but after the spirit. No, that's not what it says. It says there is therefore now no condemnation, period, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. So it's not you walking by the spirit that sets you free. It's Jesus that sets you free. And from there, you will walk by the spirit because all of Romans 8 is about living the life of the spirit. But that's not how you get out of condemnation. You get out of condemnation because Jesus graciously gave you the gift of perfect righteousness and you cannot have perfect righteousness and any measure of condemnation sharing the same space. So you, there's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, period. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. So that's where we start with Romans 8. We're going to skip through because I want to talk to you a little bit about the creation sonship connection in Romans 8. Let's go all the way down to verse 14. And I want to contend to you that Romans 8, that, which is the guts of Romans... I, I want to contend to you that Romans 8 is not about you and your personal salvation. Romans 8 is about your invitation to be glorious. Nowhere in Romans, not just 8, anywhere, matter of fact, the word heaven is not in Romans 8. And nowhere in Romans 8 or Romans is there the concept from Paul of you dying one day and going to heaven? And I just finished this morning. Nate was in here when I walked in this morning, having just finished a deep dive into all of Paul's letters, and not one time in any of Paul's letters could I find the idea of dying and going to heaven. So if you being saved from dying and going to hell is the gospel, Paul failed to preach it. I see, I can feel the emails coming. (laughs) Here's what you and I have to begin to understand. We have to rescue Romans from the lens that we inherited in religion that makes all of it about a legal justification so that we have some type of assurance that we will go to heaven when we die. That is not what Romans is about, and it's certainly not what Romans 8 is about. Let me just read this to you. This is the title of my message for tonight, How Religion Almost Ruined Romans. (laughs) Romans has been read, especially in the West. (laughs) You want me to say that again? 
how religion almost ruined Romans. I'm here to stop religion from ruining Romans tonight, okay? <laughs> Romans has been read, especially in the West, as a book that the sole topic is about me or us and my or our individual salvation. Our souls going to heaven instead of hell when we die, and that is not what Romans is about. Paul is addressing more than our human sin and not our fear of burning forever in hell. Let me read it again. Paul is addressing more than our human sin and Paul is not at all addressing our fear of burning forever in hell. Not at all. He's addressing something far more than this. He's actually giving us the keys as to just how a man in a state of internal chaos can be liberated and how in turn one such liberated man will be so glorious in the earth as a human being that that man will indeed settle a chaotic cosmos into her pre-intended glory and rest. All right, I'm gonna read that to you again, ready? Paul is addressing more than our human sin and Paul is not at all addressing our fear of burning forever in hell. He's addressing something far more significant than this. He's giving us the keys as to just how, listen to this, just how a man in a state of internal chaos can be liberated and how in turn one such liberated man will be so glorious in the earth as a human being that that man will indeed settle a chaotic cosmos into her pre-intended glory and rest. How important then is the Romans 4 invitation for you and I to enter rest? Me resting in my identity as a son that has matured into likeness with Jesus has created enough rest in me that now a cosmos in chaos can listen to me when I tell her it's time to return to order again. I know you lost your governor in the garden. Adam's first responsibility that he was given is rulership of that garden. That garden was going to go the way Adam wanted it to. And when Adam left the track, chaos lost the voice. I mean, cre creation lost the voice that was intended to govern her. This is important. It's important. It's important. That's, that's why the, the, the King James, the translation in the King James of Romans 8, which starts talking about the creature, is ridiculous. It's nothing to do with a creature, it's not a small woodland creature. So the creature was subject to vanity. It's a small woodland creature it started staring at itself in the mirror, you know, <laughs> creature. So it's not talking about creatures. It's talking about creation. It's talking about the whole cosmic realm became subject to futility, not because of what the creation had done wrong, but because man had lost the authority that is a secondary consequence of bearing the image. Yes. This is the big thing. And so for you and I to try to get back to authority because we have the doctrine of sonship is not going to get it done. You can read a hundred books on how you're a son. It's not going to get it done. You're going to have to start to look like the eldest brother who is the perfect expression of the father and understand that we were predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. We're all familiar with Romans 8, 28. Can you put that up there for me, Sarah? Skip ahead to Romans 8, 28. We're all familiar with this. We love it. We're convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan to bring good into our lives. So we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his design purpose. Stop right there. And, and one of the things I've been doing with this is I've been taking this apart in the Greek word by word. And what I'm finding is we had this mistaken as well. This is not things working for our good. This is God working with us and our things to bring about good. It's not the thing's job to become good. It's because we grew up with all things work together for good for us because of God. No, no, no. God is taking the things. Oh, hello. And he's working them in such a way that even bad things are beginning to bring about good things because God decided to work with less than ideal situations. All right, but listen to verse 29 of Romans 8. That's verse 28. Let's look at verse 29. 
For he knew all about us before we were born, and he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. That means the son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like him, predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. Look at it again. He knew all about us before we were born, and he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. This means the son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like him. The aim of Paul is those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. Right? That's 830 and 831. So the aim of Paul is to get you and I to the understanding that, listen, we were pre-designed for glorification, and glorification is a witness that we've become image bearers, and image bearers is a witness that we understand we've been invited into a measure of union that brings about more than the salvation of our soul. It actually brings about the transformation of our identity. That don't have anything to do with, with legality. There's nothing forensic about that. That's not you getting your paperwork in order so you can stand before God and say, I believed the right things and I prayed the right things and I prayed it exactly the way they told me to pray. Therefore, I have entrance into glory. That's not glory. That's, okay. Heaven is on hold waiting for you to get home ready. We are the advance team getting ready to bring heaven home. Their state is temporary. We are on the permanent place. The end of the Bible is not about people dying and going to heaven. It's about a new Jerusalem coming to the earth. The intention of God was always to make this world his ultimate seat of rule, reign, authority, and yes, glory. And you and I are being the, 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 the advanced team, the forerunning ones who begin to engage in a measure of union that brings about a measure of likeness that allows us to stand in such a state of glorification that a creation that has been groaning for somebody to look like Jesus begins to have the needs of her growth grown met by you and I growing into what it is the father has designed for us to be. And that's not going to happen intellectually. It has to happen experientially. And I'm going to prove that to you in just a little while. None of this will happen because we're experts on Romans eight. All of it will happen if we step into the fusion of the measure of union we were designed for that will birth in us supernatural grace to become image bearers. Yes, sir. The church doesn't get inaugurated with rocks splitting, earthquakes happening, veils being torn into, dead people getting out of their graves, walking around town. Second phase of inauguration, a mighty rushing wind... <laughs> fills the place where they're seated, cloven tongues like as a fire set upon each of them. That's how this is inaugurated. It's not, we're not going to reach the pinnacle of something that needed that for inauguration by what we do liturgically on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. No, it's going to take a group of people who say yes to a measure of mysterious union that births in us a heart for mysticism and wonder and glory that makes us wake up every day and say, take me by the hand, let's go dig through the rocks until we find the treasure chest. Thank you, Lord. Verse 14 of Romans 8. You back with me, Sarah? The mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. I've taught on that many times. I'm going to try to lay off of that tonight. You did not receive the spirit of religious duty. This is what we touched on last week, right? Leading you back into the fear of never being good enough. But you have received the spirit of full acceptance and folding you into the family of God. You will never feel orphaned. Y'all remember this last week? For as he, the spirit, rises up within us, our spirits join him in saying the words of a tender affection, beloved father, for the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers into our innermost being you are God's beloved child that none of that was taught to me in Pentecostal churches about the Holy Spirit 
Nobody told me anything, the Holy Spirit had anything to do with anything about belovedness. It's about empowerment to live holy. You get smited. And since we are his true children, we qualify to share all his treasures, for indeed we are heirs of God himself. <laughs> and since we are joined to Christ, we also inherit all that he has and all that he, ha all that he is and all that he has. We talked about that a little bit last week too. Both, all that he is and all that he has. We will experience being co-glorified with him, provided that we accept his sufferings as our own. Now, there's a substitutionary element there to the atonement. There's nothing, it's not a penal substitutionary element, but there is a substitutionary element, and it's good. Verse 18 says, I'm convinced that any suffering we endure is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of glory that is about to be unveiled within us. Oh, man, I love it. This is as Paul says, we're close. We're close. And they were. And they did, and then the pause button got hit because we began, watch this, especially in the late Middle Ages, we began to focus more on the forensic side of things. And we began to teach things not about people becoming glorious. We began to teach things about people dying and going to heaven. Mm. Two of the worst things that ever happened to the church in my day is gospel music, black and southern. Black gospel music and southern gospel music. And the reason why is because we had a people who began to write out of a soulish place of emotion that did not have an understanding of what it is we were doctrinally designed for. That's why there's been a huge shift in consciousness in people to even prepare them for this message by way of a worship movement where people begin to take the attention away from dying and going to heaven and begin to put the attention back on the face of the Father. Yes. And when we, watch that, when we reorient or recalibrate right there, that reorientation releases a grace, not for you and I to make all of our songs about how glorious it's gonna be when we die. I don't wanna die, and none of you do. So something in you believes that there's something for you inside of time for which you don't have to die to experience. You actually accept Jesus' death and you get to participate until you're co-crucified, co-entombed, and co-resurrected with him. The good stuff is not for dead people, it's for people raised from the dead. Well, when's that gonna happen? Read Romans 6, it happened when you got baptized. We didn't just do a baptismal service. We resurrected 300 kids from the dead when we put them in the pool and they were buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk again in newness of life right then in that moment. If we believed that, we'd baptize a lot more people. Feel the glory of the Lord. It's one of the most amazing things that we've ever been a part of to march down there, to walk down there and to hear them singing and to know that there were issues, there were addictions, there were challenges, there were anxieties and depressions and suicidal thoughts and sexual orientation confusion that stayed at the bottom of that swimming pool. And those kids came up out of that water and you know what they were? New creatures. And now we're gonna teach them that they're designed to rule the new creation. Yes. It's not just about you being a new creature. It's about your new creation introducing you to your original vocation. And your original vocation was to reign in life through the perfect gift of righteousness, Romans 5, 17. Y'all okay? I'm, we, we, we shucking corn, like country folk used to say. We're shucking corn tonight. We're getting somewhere. I want you to hear this. We're understanding the outworking of theosis. And this is how the Lord told me to do this. The Lord told me to do three things specifically through the month of May until we get to the two-year anniversary of having been here. He told me to do three things. He said, emphasize the outworking of beloved identity and then return and emphasize beloved identity. And then he said, and then when I nudge you to, just minister to their hearts. Wow. 
That's the three things he told me to do. So we'll talk theosis on some nights, and then we may start talking about our governmental responsibilities in the new creation. And then there may be other nights where all we do is talk about how the love of the Father is overwhelming and lavishing our hearts. All That's going to become our three-strand cord, the Holy Spirit showed me, that'll create something here that can't be easily broken. So some nights you're just going to hear how loved you are, how loved you are, how loved you are, how loved you are, and then you're going to begin to hear, and this is how creation responds to the ones who know how loved they are and know how loved they are and know how loved they are. This is how cancer is going to respond to the ones who know how loved they are and know how loved they are and know how loved they are. We got our, got our reports back for a crime. My dad sent them to me today in the city of Mobile. Year we got here, 51 murders. Next year, 41 murders. Last year, 31 murders. 51 to 41 to 31, another 17% drop in violent crime. No storms. No evacuations, no having to watch anything stern in the Gulf of Mexico. Come on, friends. So your your beloved identity is not you being selfish and soaking in the presence of God. It's you being made into such a measure of an image bearer that you can actually begin to speak to creation and say, settle down, girl, we're here now. We've been so scared to death to use the word universe. But then we're going to see some universal cooperation. I heard a theologian that I really trust. He's actually a bishop in the Orthodox Church. Very, 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 very intelligent man that I've had the opportunity to bump into on a couple of occasions who said this. He said, in less than two generations, the church that exists now will have to be apologized for, for her stance toward environmental issues the same way the church two generations ago had to apologize for their stance regarding slavery. Boom. Hello? We don't care about the planet. Get as much out of this sucker as we possibly can. It ain't going to be here anyway. As a famous uh, J. Vernon Gee, famous theologian said, why polish the brass on a sinking ship? It's what he said about the earth. A theologian. He, this, this, is a, this was a statement that was used in the church that I grew up in. Why would you rearrange the furniture on the Titanic? The earth is going down anyway. The late great planet earth, the most popular book during the Jesus movement, was the late great planet earth. And everybody saw God moving as a sign that this world was coming to an end. And I think the recreation has had generations of being put on pause because we have not been taught the authority that we're supposed to be operating in by way of, listen, not people who have our doctrines in order, but people who are starting to look like the sun. You go to pray for cancer and cancer goes, whoa, I wasn't going to leave that body, but you're starting to look a lot like that guy who every time he prayed for anything, it happened. And so all of a sudden this starts to happen and things start to shift and things start to change, not because of what we know, but because of who we're becoming image bearers. How, you know, How much does God look like Jesus exactly? Here's your next question. How much did Adam look like God? And (laughs) how much distinction did creation see between the voice of God and the voice of Adam? It's a question. But did the wind say, I'm not doing what Adam says, but if Jesus tells me to, I'll do it. No, no, no. Creation was not made to be governed by Jesus. Uh Uh-oh. He didn't set it up that way. When Adam bought into the mythological God and bailed out on his walks, he began to migrate away from the image that manifested genuine authority. When he began to move away from the fellowship that birthed the image, he began to lose the image. When he, lo- when he lost the union that birthed the image, he also in turn lost the image. And when the image was lost, creation had no idea what to do. And since then, she's been screaming for help. I believe Jesus encountered an unusual amount of storms in three and a half years. Because I believe the storms were coming to him to find out what to do. 
And he told them, settle on down now. Peace be still. And the wind goes, that's the voice we've been missing. Oh, come on. Y'all hearing? Are you with me? Peace be still. And the wind went, thank God. Gulf of Mexico, settle down in the Gulf of Mexico. Thank God. I've been waiting on somebody. I can't do this on my own. I was set up to be ruled by the ones who look like him. And now that some of them are starting to look like him, I know I'm about to be released from my slavery to futility. All right, let's go a little further. We got time? Yes, time? We got we a flight in the morning. We'll be good till we have to fly out of here. All right, you ready? We do. We do have a flight in the morning. Um, let's look at verse 18. I'm convinced that any suffering we endure is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of glory that is about to be unveiled within us. The entire universe is standing on tippy toe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. <laughs> oh man, this is so good. The entire universe is standing on tippy toe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. For against its will, the universe itself had to endure the empty futility resulting from the consequences of human sin. Hamartia. But now, with eager expectation, all creation, not creatures, all creation longs for freedom from its slavery to decay. And to experience with us the wonderful freedom coming to God's children. To this day, we are aware of the universal agony and groaning of creation as it were in the contractions of labor for childbirth. And it's not just creation. We who have already experienced the first fruits, I would cross that out and put the word awakening there. That's what that word actually means. The awakening of the spirit also inwardly grown as we passionately long to experience our full status as God's sons and daughters, including... Our physical bodies being transformed. What kind of likeness are we talking about? Not theoretical. Actual, you change the way that you look. What is the differentiating characteristic between where we are now and where we're going? Light. Whole thing's about light. The whole thing's about light. That's where we started. Let there be light. Light burst onto the scene at 186,000 miles a second or so and has not stopped yet. It's still moving off of the word that generated it. And you and I are called to be the light of the world. And what we're stepping into, I've been saying this, what we're stepping into is an illuminative state whereby we begin to radiate Love as a consequence of the measure of that love that we're receiving, we have no choice but to be generators of that same love. And as we generate the light and the love, creation begins to respond to beloved identity. Beloved identity is a witness that you and I are being transformed into Christ's likeness. I'm, I'm being changed. I'm, I've got a lot of changing to do. There was a day I never would apologize to you. I tell you, we're running all the sissies off. That's really, that's how I thought. Is, and we just, there's people not tough enough to receive it. They need to get on down the road. They'll get offended later. I'd rather go ahead and offend them now. Y'all didn't, y'all didn't know me then. Be thankful. Some of y'all did. Some of y'all did. You have the calluses to prove it. And, and so what's happening is the Father's beginning to transform a people and it's beginning to show up in the fruit of the Sermon on the Mount. We're starting to care about people and we're starting to love people and our heart's starting to be moved for people. And instead of being people who are insiders pointing to the outsiders, judging them because they haven't decided to become insiders, we're actually looking and saying, you know what? We haven't been real good insiders. But we're, going, we're becoming Christ-like. Not Christians, Christ-like. Not Christians, not American, Western, religious Christians. We're becoming Jesus followers who are now being infused with the life source of Jesus by way of moving into an interaction with him that is bringing in a transformation. And the first place it'll start is in your thoughts. That's why the gospel begins with metanoia. The first thing that'll happen is change the way you think. 
Change the way you think. That's why I know people who are racist haven't heard the gospel. If they've heard it, they've not accepted it because there's no way you could still think that way. I don't care how you were raised. I'm not talking to you about how you've been raised. I'm talking to you about how you think. And if you judge other people over pigment, see, I was about to call you stupid again, and I just had to get up and apologize for that. But that is kind of stupid. <laughs> All right, I ain't having a ride like that home again. God, no, help me. The invitation is into doxa. Doxa is the Greek word for glory. Kavod is the Hebrew word for glory. In, in, in Hebrew, it means weightiness, which has been rightly translated as kavod, but the, it's more than weightiness. It's a weightiness belonging to kingly authority. Is the, is the Hebraic concept of glory. That Hebraic concept is translated over into Greek as doxa. Doxa means splendor or brightness. Magnificence. Listen to this. Kingly majesty. This is what you were born for. And this is the state you're being regenerated into. So we have a recreated cosmos that's on hold waiting for a regenerated humanity to understand the fullness of what we've inherited with our regeneration. And we've turned it all into, we repeated the prayer so we're not dying and going to hell. And nobody has any expectation of being glorious. Glorification is doxadzo, which literally takes those words. Let's just look at that real quick. Glorification is doxadzo or glorified, and it means to make you into one who has splendor or who is brightness, magnificence, kingless, king, uh, kingly majesty. <laughs> to cause the dignity or worth of a person to become both manifest and acknowledged. So this is what Jesus is bringing us into. He's bringing us into not simply salvation, but he's moving us away from the plan of salvation being the declaration of the gospel of the kingdom. And he's causing us to see, although the plan of salvation is not wrong in and of itself, it certainly is not the gospel of the kingdom. The Romans road is not the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom is you were brokenhearted, you were lowly and depressed, you were dealing in mourning, you had a spirit of heaviness on you, and Jesus came and took all of that off of you and exchanged what you had for who he is. He didn't exchange what you have for what he had. He exchanged what you had for who he is, and he gave you his own identity, and you and I have now been re-identified, and the cosmos is going seriously is it finally going to happen we've been running wild and we hate it we've been causing diseases and we hate it we've been causing viruses and we hate it we've been taking lives with storms and we hate it we want our garden days back feel this and, and, I, and I'm, 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 the Lord is teaching me right now even about the ecological responsibilities to all of this. I'm not, when I talk about ecology, I'm not talking about carbon gases and reducing your carbon f footprint. I think that's good, actually. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being able to speak to a creation that's been raped and restore her. I'm, I'm talking about speaking to substances under the earth and saying you have been mishandled, but the glorious ones are here to tell you that it's time for you to bring forth the greatest resources we've ever seen. And you're going to begin to hand them over to the image bearers and your locked up treasures and resources are going to begin to float like wine vats overflowing with new wine because the sons are going to unlock you. And some of you are worried about how you're going to pay your rent. Come on, man, you're going to be fine. You're going to do more than pay your rent. You're going to be paying other people's rent. You're going to be paying for your house and buying other people's house. you got to get out of this saved thing and get in this glorification deal. What I'm talking about is a Trinitarian soteriology. I'm talking about what the Father, Son, and Spirit meant when they decided to incarnate the Word and become the Logos, which means logic of God. Jesus is the logic of God. Jesus is exactly precisely what God has to say about himself. He's the word made flesh that dwelt among us and we beheld the beauty of his glory. 
the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We beheld his glory, and now in continuing to behold his glory, we are becoming glorious, and the glorious ones literally are beginning, beginning, beginning to be given grace for cosmic renewal. Or we can just keep getting people to repeat the prayer. And listen, that beats the crap out of being an atheist. But it's a terrible place to stop. I said, crap, y'all should clap and give me an offering right now. You don't know how much self-discipline that took. Listen, so here's the, here's the understanding. We got, we, get, we got to get the people not going to hell. That's the whole goal. We don't want people going to hell. The whole goal is you becoming so glorious that people want the heaven you have access to now. I don't need to be preaching about the afterlife. There's too much to be preached about the now life. And the now life is the answer for the afterlife. So you becoming as happy as you can be, as filled with peace as you can be, as filled with, with assurance and authority as you can be, releases the cosmos that's going. Can somebody show me what life is supposed to look like? And you go, yeah, I can. He came that I might have life and have it more abundantly or have it in the fullest. Now, we took the thief cometh not but steal, kill, and destroy out of John 10 and made that about the devil. There, the devil's not mentioned anywhere in the context of John 10. The thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy is not the devil. The thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy is the guy who's supposed to be using the door, but he's an illegitimate leader sneaking in through a window. The thief is religion, not the devil. Yes. Now, I'm not saying the devil's not the captain of religion, but he's certainly not the thief in that story. The thief in that story is somebody who ought to be using the door, but they've come in with a bunch of legalism and they've heaped a bunch of rules on people because they don't want to come through the door. Jesus said, I am the door of life. If you don't come through me, you're a thief and a robber. Yes. There's people, you ask them what they believe and they'll tell you they're Baptist. That wasn't the question. But religion said, let this be your identity. So now we got fundamental Baptist, we got primitive Baptist, we got free will Baptist, we got independent Baptist, we got Southern Baptist, we got full gospel. Y'all heard about the man who got stranded on an island? He got stranded on an island. My dad knows this one. He got stranded on an island. The man was stranded on the island. They found him and they said, well, what did you do while you were stranded on the island? He said, well, I built me a place to live and over here is where I cook my food. He said, and I built two churches. He said, what in the world did you build two churches to? He said, well, I'm Baptist and I knew one of them was going to split. So I want to go ahead and have a second one ready for now and split out that first one. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to beat on Baptist people, but I certainly want to point out the fallacy of religion to bring you into life. Life is not I've mastered the rules. Life is I've been mastered by the ruler. Come on. Let me say it again. Life is not you mastering the rules. It's you surrendering to being mastered by the ruler and being in full trust and assurance. He's got this and it's all working together and he's the one making it work and it's all for my good. Why? Because I've been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. I feel like preaching this a little bit tonight. I got to stop right here. Let me stop right here. Whew. Thank you, Lord. Redefining glory, we must redefine glory in the light of beloved righteousness. We have to redefine glory by redefining gospel and differentiating the gospel from the plan of salvation, which in and of itself is not altogether wrong, but it is entirely the plan of salvation that is. It's entirely too incomplete to be characterized as the gospel. Let me be clear, Romans and specifically Romans 8 is not about where your soul will go when you die. Paul never talks about going to heaven here in Romans 8, anywhere else in Romans, or anywhere else in any of his correspondence. For Paul, the glory was not a place we went to in the future, but an identificational inheritance reserved for the image bearers right now. Glory. That service was glorious. It, yeah. It, things can be glorious. But the goal is not for the building to just be filled with the glory. That happened in the tabernacle and the temple. And then Jesus tried to give us a new paradigm for what it meant to be the temple. 
So if there was a glory that filled an inferior temple where the priest could not stand to minister, know you not that your body shall be called the temple of the Holy Ghost and you're going to be filled with a glory where every other ruling thing in you can't stand anymore and the only thing that will be left in you to rule is the identity you've inherited through union with Jesus. Are y'all following me? Okay, can I give you one more thought and we'll go home. I got some image bearing notes. I'm going to skip those. I'm making myself a note of where to start next week. (laughs) Glory, again, is doxa. It means splendor or brightness, magnificence, kingly majesty. Kavod is the Hebrew word for glory, and it means weighty. Mm. It's dealing with kingly authority, not just a weight, but if we would say the man's words had weight or he was a weighty individual, it's identifying individuals that operate in a measure of kingly majesty. So these words are real similar out of the Greek. The word glorified or even glorification is doxadzo, which means that you are being made into. You don't make yourself glorious. You are being made glorious. Watch this. What are you being made? Splendor or brightness, magnificence. You are being made kingly majesty. I believe glory for Paul had more to do with you and I, my God, taking our intended seats as the human beings reigning in life by way of the gift of purchase of righteousness than it ever did about dying and going to heaven. Be clear, dying and going to heaven, best plan B you can get but it is plan B. Why? Because no person who is here, when Jesus deals with the last enemy death, 1 Corinthians 15, and sets up his eternal rule on planet earth from that point forward, nobody who didn't die when that happened missed out on anything by not going to heaven. I, 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 want, I plan on being here when that happens. And that means I'm going to have to have my physical body transformed because that's not going to happen for a long, 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 long time. Why? Because we've got to undo years of being stuck in the cycle of religion where we didn't even know we were supposed to be image bearers. We've been too busy trying to stay saved as if it was fragile. Oh, now. Psalm 8, and we'll go home. Psalm 8 being at the back of my Bible messes with me every time. I'm trained to go left. Psalm 8. Woo! Lord, your name is so great and powerful. People everywhere see your splendor. Your glorious majesty streams from the heavens, filling the earth with the fame of your name. How far is heaven and earth apart? Look at the verse. Your glorious majesty streams from the heavens, filling the earth with the fame of your name. He is talking about that as a present reality. He's saying, David, okay, your glorious majesty streams, not will stream one day, streams currently from the heavens, filling the earth with the fame of your name. Verse two, you have built a stronghold by the songs of babies. Strength rises up with the chorus of singing children. That's out of the mouths and babes and sucklings God has ordained praise, which is really the word strength. His ordained strength. Let's look at it again. You have a stronghold by the songs. You have built a stronghold by the songs of babies. I'm teaching this because I turned around and looked tonight at Mala Dove during the worship expression. And both hands are just going after God and worshiping. And the Lord brought me to Psalm 8 in that moment. You have built a stronghold by the songs of babies. Come on, tin man, hear me. In our weakness, his strength is made perfect. Strength rises up with the chorus of singing children. The ki- that, this kind of praise has the power to shut Satan's mouth. Childlike worship will silence the madness of those who oppose you. So here we have babies. And then we have children. And then what do we have from there? Childlikeness. They're our compass. And if we're paying attention, they're trying to invite us back 
to a place of vulnerability and assurance that when he says he wants to spin us, we say yes. Isn't it good? So good. Now we're going to get this interesting stuff here and I'm going to let you go home. (sighs) Look at the splendor of your skies. Verse three, your creative genius glowing in the heavens. When I gaze at your moon and your stars mounted like jewels in their settings, I know you are the fascinating artist who fashioned it all. But when I look up and see such wonder and workmanship above, I have to ask you this question. Compared to all this cosmic glory, why would you bother with puny mortal man? That's a terrible translation. I picked on King James. I'm fixing to pick on Dr. Simmons. Nowhere does the original demean the nature of man when it says, who is man? That you're mindful of him and the son of man that you would visit him. We've asked the question wrongly. I was raised that that meant, who is man? That you're mindful of him. I think what it actually means is, who is man? That you're mindful of him. That word is remember. Who, who is this man that you remember him? Who is the son of man? That's Adam. That's the word Adam. Who is this Adam man that you would visit him? Why would you bother with puny mortal men? That's a terrible translation. This next part's really good. Or be infatuated with Adam's sons. I am here to say to you tonight, you're not Adam's sons. That's who David was talking to. You're not Adam's sons. And if he was infatuated with Adam's sons, how much more is his infatuation for the sons of Yeshua? (laughs) Verse five, yet... What honor you have given to men. Now, here's, here's, here's how I disarm this whole idea that men are puny and they're insignificant and why would God think about them? Then how do you explain verse five? You've given honor to men. Created a little lower than Elohim. Not angels. Elohim. Mess that one up too, King Jim. Crowned like kings and queens. Watch this. With glory and magnificence. Who? Man. Verse six, you have delegated to them mastery over all you have made, making everything subservient to their authority, placing earth itself under the feet of your image bearers. Romans eight, Psalm eight. Romans eight, Psalm eight. David knew this was the idea all along. The idea all along was for him to delegate to men that he was infatuated with, according to the previous verse, and making everything subservient to whose authority? Men's. Placing earth itself under the feet of your image bearers. All the created order in every living thing of the earth, sky, and sea, the wildest beasts and all sea creatures, everything is in submission to Adam's sons. Lord, your name is so great and powerful. People everywhere see your majesty. What glory streams from the heavens, that's a repeat of verse one, filling the earth with the fame of your name. Now here's what David knew. David knew how this was supposed to work. And he knew men were supposed to be the ruling agents of the cosmic order. And he believed that they were to function that way under an inferior covenant. You and I, have relinquished the delegated authority that we've been called to. And by way of us acquiescing and relinquishing authority, we've left the earth in a chaotic state of not knowing who the cosmos is because the cosmos has been waiting on us to reveal to her how she's designed to function. And we don't need her to just function the way she functioned in Eden. We need her to function on earth as it is in heaven. I'm going to let you go home, I promise. But here's the thought. Here's where things begin to hinge. Beholding is the means of becoming what? Like Jesus. 
What happens when you and I begin to come, become like Jesus? All of a sudden, a universe that's been on tiptoe, eagerly in expectation, like a woman in childbirth experiencing contractions, shout out to Macy, like a woman in childbirth experiencing contractions, the earth has been saying what? Who will help deliver me? Because there's something in me for you. Hold on. Remember, we got a pregnant earth who's trapped in slavery to decay. The earth is decaying and it's not supposed to. So what's going to stop the decay and reverse the decay and bring the earth into the state of regeneration? When she sees the unveiling of the sons in their glory. Not the sons with their right doctrines, but the sons in their glorious state. What, what, do you, what do you do from here? You say, Theosis, I just received a fresh infusion of understanding as to what's going on in me. Sir, I think I'll have more. And my heart got healed up tonight. And he took me by the hand and dug through the rocks, pulled the, the key out of his own robe and unlocked it and put the heart back inside of my chest. Now that your heart's being made whole, do you know what happens to you next? You become an oak of righteousness and you're about to be a part of seeing ruined cities begin to be regenerated. Wherever you go, you are, let me, I'm going to mess with you one time, I'll let you go home. You are manifesting the energy of regeneration. Why? Because you're being regenerated. Our mortal bodies are being transformed. Being transformed. What's on the other side of being transformed? It's not just that you don't have cancer growing in your body. It's that you emanate glory everywhere you go. When I look at you, I don't see, I beat cancer. You never paid attention to cancer. You didn't give cancer a seat at the table. You said, this must be Abba saying there's more of me for you. I'm, I'm not, I walked with her in there. I'm telling you, I've never seen anything like it in my life. I've seen people, you know, suffer more with a toothache than she did with metastasized cancer. I'm serious. Never complained. Never whined. Didn't do the why me thing. The only thing we ask why about, Melissa, the only thing we ask why about is why she had to go first. You know what he said? Somebody has to. And she's the best designed to do it because she knows she's loved. Now, I'm, I wasn't okay. Well, if she dies, she's going to go to heaven. The only thing that's better than is dying and going to hell. And I didn't think there was a chance that chick was going to get anywhere near hell, whether she ever went to my church or not. But he's unlocking glory. And all we got to do is accept his suffering as our own and say, I was buried with him. I was crucified with him. I was buried with him. I'm resurrected. And here's the thing. Those he predestined pro arizo. It's one of my favorite Greek words. Those he pre-horizoned. He called kaleo. And those he called, he justified, which is the word from the word dikaiusenai. Dikaio. Dikaio is the word. And it's where we get the word dikaios. And it's not justified in a legal sense. It should have never been translated justified. Those he gave perfect righteousness to, he glorified. Doxadzo. Pro aridzo. Kaleo. Deco of de, from dekaiosene. Righteousness. And then doxadzo. Doxadzo. So this is what we're saying. This is what he's saying. He's saying, listen, I fashioned you beforehand to be glorious. And how I got you here, I called you 
I gave you my righteousness. What's the next step? Don't stop right there. Move into doxadzo. Become the splendor of the Father in the earth. All right. Thank you, thank you, Luke. Buy the quit. Buy the equipment to to do the pool thing. Go on in. I heard the Lord say tonight, go on in. Remember, there was one more stop. You thought the one more stop was the one where there was one more stop. And I felt the Lord saying, I'm going to breathe on this pool thing. You're going to hire some people that come in here. You're going to give people jobs. You're going to have people cleaning pools. You're going to have people repairing pools. You're going to have people building pools. You're going to have build, build, building pools in hotels. You're going to be building pools in apartment complexes. And it's going to be the most fun you've ever had getting out of bed and going to work in your life. Your boys are going to do this with you. It's going to be a glorious thing. I bless you. There's no risk there. Oh, I feel this. Holy Ghost. Holy Mundo Mosokoram. Ye Dilibokondamaka. I call you righteous ones into glorification. The righteous ones will now begin to inherit and begin to inherit a state called glorious. It's happening to you. Every time I see you, Kelsey. It's happening to, I'm telling you, it's happening to you. I can see it every time I look at you, every time I get around, every time you worship right here in front of me, I know where you are because I can feel you beginning to radiate somebody who's found out who you are, found out how treasured you are, doesn't need anybody else to tell you anymore. You know that you have found such favor in his eyes that he's just dressing you with light. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. What I love about the revelation of you and I being designed to be glorious is it changes this whole what we were saved for thing. God saved you to save creation through you. Not just what you're saved from, but what you're saved for. Now that you're learning what you're saved for, you're actually going to save creation by becoming what you were saved for. To look like Jesus. I want to be clear. I want to be clear that this glorification, according to Paul, was something for human beings living inside of time, resurrected from the dead by way of baptism. It's Romans 6. And what starts to happen when you understand this is everything else you've strived to become or do sits down on the inside of you. And you say, I'm going to give the rest of my life to one thing. One thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So I, I call you into a place of interior rest, not striving to become, but yielding to the engagement that you've been invited into. This is not going to happen because you're being introduced to different intellectual concepts. This is going to happen by the fusion of union. The fire of perfect love is changing us, is it not? The fire of perfect love is changing us. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for healed hearts. Thank you for you hiding our hearts away so they'd be there for safekeeping. And thank you for you keeping the key at your own heart for our heart and unlocking the box and putting that heart back in our chest. I thank you for a group of people in Mobile, Alabama that are becoming glorious. I thank you for the glorious unveiling of the sons of God that are beginning to cause creation to understand what all the disarray has been about and she is snapping back into order and beginning to yield fruit to the sons as they begin to manifest their intention as image bearers. Father, if I could pray one thing tonight, it would be more grace for union. 
communion. It would be more grace for face-to-face encounters. It would be more grace to experience a higher measure of the revelation of how deeply and dearly we are loved. So we open up our hearts and say more yes to more grace to become everything you've designed for us to be. I bless this people in their journey into great union and fusion. And I declare that the fire of their encounters is actually bringing about the transformation of their physical bodies. And as our bodies are transformed, we're being positioned to rule and reign the way that you have designed us for. I thank you for a people of theosis. I thank you for a people who have understood that beholding is the means of becoming and that we are becoming that that we have been pre pro arizod to become. We have been pre-horizoned to be like your son. And I thank you that we are receiving grace to become all that you've designed us to be. I speak glory over this people. Not just glory in our meetings, but glory in their car, glory in their home, and glory in their identity, Father, that they become the glorious ones that you've designed and intended for them to be. In the awesome name of Yeshua. Can you say yes? Yes.